What's up, Maridistas, and happy Wednesday. This is Kian Sobani. I am releasing a small clip here for you guys who are not members yet. And it's from last night's post-game podcast that went up after Real Madrid beat Braga in Braga. And the full episode, obviously, is much longer. In this particular segment, Ewan McTeer and I, we're talking about Rodrigo. We're doing some screen sharing. And that's kind of why I picked this clip in particular, because there's a, there's a video element to it in case you're watching it on YouTube. But if you're not, you'll still understand what we're saying. No big deal. Uh, we also talk about Vinicius, some Ancelotti post-game quotes, midfield performance. Um, I think that's it. The full episode, we break down the game in full detail, and it's currently Wednesday. So we're also doing a live call later today. If you're a member, you get to join our live call every single week. Turn on your camera. Turn on your microphone, ask us questions, have conversations with us about football or anything you want. And it's obviously very Real Madrid focused and we dig into the weeds and details. And it's really fun having those conversations with you guys. So look forward to that live chat today. And then tomorrow we're doing a mailbag. Lucas and I are are answering more questions that come in through Discord and Patreon. And if you want access to everything, because we're only doing two free shows a week. If you want to be a part of the family and be a part of everything and make sure you don't miss anything, go to patreon.com slash managing Madrid, join the family, and you get a ton of value in return. All right, guys, enjoy the clip. Thank you, and let's get to it. So Rodrigo scores, and in that moment, I felt like there was a bit of, for me anyway, and I don't know how other fans felt, I don't know if relief is the right word, but... Just felt like we all knew that he needed something like that. He needed a moment. And I'm not even sure if I, just based on the replay, how clean of a touch it was. But he makes a good run to meet that Vinicius. Vinicius does really well. The the play starts from a, a ball over the top from Nacho to the left wing. And Nacho, and Vinicius just cook uh, Serdar. And that was the ball over the top I was talking about. It was on pretty much every time. Rudiger and Nacho received the ball on the back line. They looked up. They could see Vinicius trying to make that run. They were trying to hit him. Kamavinga and Modric were given a lot of space and time on the ball as well to pick those passes out. Uh, So that play results in a Rodrigo goal. I kind of was... I'm very curious to get your assessment of this. I felt that beyond that goal, I'm not sure how involved Rodrigo was and I checked it and if you look at the pass map from this game I'll see if I can actually bring it up uh, on share screen this is not a public uh, video it's only for members so if you're keeping an eye on uh, the video you can kind of see the pass map I posted on Twitter as well but Rodrigo is number 11 here pretty disconnected from the rest of the team and I looked at he has he had 29 touches this was very similar to the Napoli game in that he wasn't really involved as the other side, which is the left side where everything goes through. Uh, and I was curious to know what your thoughts on Rodrigo was. It can be about this game. It can be overarching points or whatever. What do you think? I mean, to give, I guess, then an, an overarching point is like, we look at goals far too much. Like this game was not one of his better performances, but some of the games when he didn't score, he played a lot better. He contributed a lot more. So um, we'll all talk about he ended the goal drought. It was something between, I think it was over 900 minutes he got to. Um, I think it's close to a 1,000 if you include the Brazil games um, since he scored in Bilbao. Yeah, that's great. He, he finished, uh, he ended the goal drought. The goal was pretty messy. Um, but, you know, um, you've got to be there and he made the right run and, and gets a little bit of luck, which he, in his post-match interview, said, yeah, he felt like he hadn't had much luck. He also thanked that Jolotti for sticking with him. Um, but Rodrigo has had some good games in this run when he wasn't scoring, even not assisting. He was, especially some of the Bernabeu games, league games, I remember Hitafe, some of these ones, like some of the Bernabeu games when he was having like 10 shots, creating loads of chances, dribbling past people, just freeing things up, shaking things up. This, he hardly did anything, but he gets the goal. So I think uh, we just need to be able to separate the goal drought from the overall involvement and performance of Rodrigo, which in this one was not necessarily all his fault. He was isolated, but sure, like not one of his best uh, outings, but he got the goal. So It's interesting to see, and uh, we're recording this at a time where Carlo Ancelotti hadn't start, started his post-game press conference yet. 
his quotes are starting to roll in now. And he said something that it seemed like kind of clear to me, but then I'm talking about Jude and he, and he popped up for a goal anyway, and it was a beautifully taken goal. But he said Jude Bellingham is fine. His adductor is a bit overloaded due to the status of the pitch. He's a bit tired, but it's normal. I'm not sure what he means by status of the pitch. I did notice that Jude wasn't having the greatest game, but he did pop up for a goal, which was impressive in itself. Um, The one that stood out to me, Ewan, was Vinicius. Hmm. Some of it, I thought he could have done better. I thought there were moments where Serdar was able to read his runs, but there were other times where he cooked Serdar. The finish on the Disalago was really good. Unfortunately, it was, I don't know, a millimeter offside, whatever the measurement, it was minimal, but I, it was technically offside. What did you think of his performance um, on that left wing? I mean, like, I think this was a good Vinicius performance. If you look at the highlight reel of Vinicius after the game, there'll be quite a lot of good stuff. But I still think he could have done more because that ball over the top was happening, like, the whole game, even the offside was basically the same thing again. Braga never corrected it, never put any more support on that side. And it was just textbook. It was like school football, you know? Like, we have a fast player against a much slower fullback. We can just <clears throat> exploit that time and time again. And when you look at the number of balls over the top or into space, not just the kind of ones that, you know, Nacho or Fran Garcia were playing um, from the back, but even some of the Bellingham passes to Vinicius in good space, um, he, you know, obviously scores assists but like what well, scores the offside goal assists the the others um but you still think there was other opportunities there where um just a little bit rusty and um i still don't think he's 100 percent after the injury but this was certainly a lot of good moments but um if you if you do a fraction percentage of the number of times when it was on um you know he he made the most of it sometimes but he left some I think some opportunities out there too from from some of the times he had all that space. Yeah, I thought given the high volume of opportunities he got in that zone, he he could have done more than he did. Um, he ends up with a disallowed goal and an and um, and two assists. It's yeah. pretty pretty solid stat line for a, a player who could have done more. But um, he did stand out in the sense that he was very active. He was not shy trying to take players on. I mean, he never is, but I thought he was mostly positive. And it was ultimately quite productive, but he could have done a little bit more possibly. Um, Yet, I just on like a pure on-ball perspective, I really liked the performance of of our midfielders. Kamavinga, his distribution was great. He was first to every 50-50 ball. Challenges in the box, just outside the box in zone 14 um, were phenomenal. His touches under pressure were great. Modric, low-key, had seven key passes tonight, and his passing was foot perfect. Fede Valverde, not as involved as those two, but he had his moments, like really covering defensively in transition, but also um, also just like had really good passing in stride in transition as well. What, what notes did you have on the midfielders? I mean, so I hadn't seen exactly that pass map you put up. I'd seen a slightly um, different one with just the average positions um, at halftime. And what struck me was just the asymmetry of the midfield. Um, I yeah. think when Modric is playing, there was I think the first game Modric played this season, he was like the highest player. He was basically where Bellingham um, had been playing in the diamond. Then pretty much every other Modric game, he's been as deep as Kamavinga, but isn't play it's not quite a double pivot um Modric starts a little bit further forward he starts a bit more to the right um but when you look at the average position it's always pretty much where Kamavinga is and I think that works in again in certain games against certain teams for example uh the Kamavinga Modric sort of double pivot but not quite was also seen in Osasuna um it was seen in this game you can do that I think against let's put it bluntly a lot weaker teams where you lose a bit defensively, you lose a lot defensively actually, but you can probably survive it because you're not playing Sevilla away, you're not playing the classical, you're not playing the Madrid derby. So, but it's interesting. I mean, it's it's so asymmetrical. It's basically Modric uh, close to Camavinga, close to Fede Valverde, leaving Bellingham just completely on his own. In these games when Modric plays, Bellingham is a much more a left midfielder than 
the tip of the diamond. He's always a little bit to the left. But in Modric's games, he's basically the only left midfielder. And I think it's kind of Angelotti saying, look, um, we only need Bellingham and Vinicius and some help from the fullback, and we can dominate the left side. Um, we would just move these other guys, Carvajal, Fede Valverde, Modric, onto the right. And we can do three guys there and leave two of top 10 players in the world on the left side, and we're we're good with that. It's it's rare to see such an asymmetrical system, um, but it's one that when Modric comes in, it becomes even more asymmetrical. It's, it's crazy. It's been that way for quite some time, but I feel like t- uh, this season it's more asymmetrical than it has been in yeah. years past in that we really don't have a right winger, like, at all. Yeah. Like, and, and that's the thing, like, if 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 Rodrigo or whoever's playing there, and again, if it's not Rodrigo, it's Jose Lu, which is even less of a right winger. So yeah. you really just don't have that presence. And, and it puts, puts a lot on Carvajal, um, who's been quite good this year anyway. But I do wonder if you're getting if you're getting that ball. Some, it's been Fede quite often too. Like he makes a run in that space mm-hmm. quite a bit. And that's why Modric and Kamabing are often deeper in a double pivot of sorts. Because Fede has to be a presence there as well, so sometimes Fede as well. But it is true. Like I feel, like, I feel like this year it's even more exaggerated. Whereas the third attacker, like in previous years, would give us something there at times. But this year we really haven't had a presence on the right wing specifically. Um, it's interesting, Ewan. Like I feel like so many sequences this season, individuals defend well better than the collective. And what I mean by that is like, you'll see breakdowns collectively, but then you'll see Nacho who like had a lot of vital clearances tonight. Um, yeah. I think he had the most of anyone on the field. Like, like, let me check. Um, but yeah, there was a heroic Rudiger block, heroic Bellingham block. Like, yeah, you know, it's um, a nice defensive highlight reel, but you're right. The collective is, um, you know, something to be analyzed. What did you think? Like, where did you? I've seen so many different placements of blame on the goal conceded. Where? Did, what? How did you see that? I mean, like number one, and it's okay to say this. Like the other team did really well. Like you can say this sometimes, you know. Um, there's the old Italian saying, which is like the perfect game of football should be no nil. Like you should be able to control and never concede. That's ridiculous. Like, sometimes there's good goals. But, I mean, you look at the replay and it's just Nacho and Fran Garcia are a little bit too far apart. Um, and Camavinga kind of stops tracking his man at some point. And you're basically then talking about the three players in that uh, position on that side of the box. And they're all just a little half yard away from where you'd want them to be. But, I mean, you also just have to give credit to the, the quick passing and finishing from Braga because... It was a nice goal from their part. It was a good goal. And and you mentioned Kamavinga stopping tracking. I thought that was... Because I saw a lot of blame on Fran Garcia and Kepa, some on Nacho. And I thought as foot perfect as Kamavinga was in this game, in that particular sequence, he just stops tracking Jallo. And um, if, he, if he actually continues tracking the whole way, I think he prevents that goal more than anyone, anything else that anyone else did defensively on that sequence. 